tonight on Revolutionaries. One of the way to serve society is by providing new technologies, new uh, um, uh, ways of thinking, and provided them to society. I truly believe that this is one of the pillars on which societies should build universities. Israel today is often described as a startup nation. The engine of Israel's innovation is the Technion Institute of Technology, which is now more than a century old. We explore the heritage and impact of the Technion with the university's 16th president, Professor Peretz Levy. Major funding for revolutionaries is provided by the Intel Corporation. The Technion uh, has its roots really predating 1912. Uh, and then the laying of the cornerstone and its formal establishment so long ago. Um, what gave rise to the existence of the Technion as an institution? Well, um, the decision to uh, open an engineering school in uh, Ottoman Palestine was made in 1901. This is the fifth Zionistic Congress. And at that time, around the turn of the century, uh, the Jews in Europe, in most of the countries, couldn't study medicine nor engineering. Numerous clauses. So 10 were accepted, but tens want to study. The universities were essentially close to them yes. in Europe. Yes. And the Congress appointed a committee of three. Uh, two of them became very well known. Chaim Weizmann, at that time he was a junior lecturer in chemistry in the University of Geneva. And Martin Buber, later to become a leading philosopher, who studied the issue and recommended to the Congress to open an engineering school. The rationale was that if one day uh, the Jews would like to build a state of their own, somebody must build it. So you need engineers. The Congress adopted the resolution called to open a technological engineering school modeled after the German mid-level school. Now the question was where to open this school. London, Paris, Zurich, Basel, where the Congress took place. And a group um, under the leadership of Theodor Herzl advocated Ottoman Palestine. And the decision was to open the school in Haifa, which in Theodor Herzl's book, Alte Neue, the old new country, Haifa was the city of the future. A city of science and technology, of industry, a crossroad of trains running between Beirut and Damascus and Baghdad and uh, Cairo. And the group that took upon itself to build this school, interestingly enough, was a German group from Berlin that the Hebrew translation of the name is Ezra, to help. I must admit, they were not Zionistic group. They were looking more to spread German tradition and German language. The first money to build the Technion came from Moscow. Each time every one of you dip a tea bag with a big W, the Wisotsky, this is where the money came from. <laughs> Kalonymus Wisotsky, who was the head of this uh, dynasty, gave 100,000 ruble for this engineering school in Haifa. But you know, uh, you plan a budget, you plan a building. In most cases, the budget is enough for half of the building. <laughs> Lucky for, for us, there was a visitor to Palestine at the time. His name was Jacob Schiff, a banker from New York. Schiff, a uh, very important figure, also in international uh, diplomacy, saw the half building and he said, I'm ready to provide you with the money to finish the building on two conditions. One condition, this school will accept students regardless of ethnic origin, religious 
political views, and gender should accept both men and women. Should remind you that around that time, many schools in the world, many universities in the world, uh, were gender biased. Mm -hmm. They didn't accept women. And here is a school in Ottoman Palestine that put on his flag equal opportunity to men and women. The second condition was that this school will have a board of governors that should be international, with members coming from all the Jewish communities around the world. So the building, uh, which was designed by a German architect named Alexander Berwald, a beautiful building uh, on the slope of the Carmel Mountain, was ready in uh, about the year 1913. But First World War started. And the Turks turned the building into a military hospital. And when the British took over, they continued to use it as a military hospital. So the first class started only uh, 12 years later. The first class started in 1924. Civil engineering and architecture, 17 students, one woman, 16 men. <laughs> so this is, in a nutshell, the history of the technicum. This is how they called it at this day. One uh, interesting aspect of the history of the technicum is the language issue. Most of the teachers of the technicum were German or came from German culture. They wanted to teach in German. The students revolted because they wanted to study in Hebrew. And if you read the newspapers of the day, there were violent demonstrations over the language of studies in the Technion. Again, lucky for us, the Hebrew camp won, and they had to read Hebrew sentences written in Latin words because they didn't have the language. <laughs> so from its outset, the university has been uh, open to all religions, to all genders, to all ethnicities, to all regions of the world. And from the story that you told with its funding, its founding, an international institution from the very beginning. Yes, the first students came from uh, all over the world, uh, mostly from Jewish communities in Poland, in Hungary, in, German, in Germany, in Russia. But uh, I found an interesting piece in the Chicago Sentinel from 1926. At that time, there were 17 students in the Technion, but there was a class of Arab students of 16 taking an evening lesson. So the school was open, mm. as declared, to groups of different ethnic origin, different languages, different uh, religious. And we keep it up to this day. And uh, uh, now we have 19% of our students are minorities, precisely as the percentage of minorities in the Israeli society. We have a picture for everyone here in the audience. Of, it's a very famous picture of the first class at the Technion. Uh, this, is this the room in the new building that was no, so long this is, delayed? It, no. This is the old building, and this is a typical uh, building. You can see the shape of the windows, which mm -hmm. have uh, oriental uh, uh, um, accent. And uh, you can see from the faces of the students how seriously they are taking their studies. The first majors were civil engineering and architecture, and I think it's probably self-evident as to why those particular majors were chosen. But that was a very deliberate decision, wasn't it? It was a deliberate decision. There was a need for civil engineers. Uh, when the British took over from the Ottomans, Palestine, there was a need for highways. There was a need for particularly for housing. There was a need for uh, um, uh, improving the infrastructure of uh, the British mandate Palestine. So uh, the Technion started by civil engineering and architecture, but later on moved to mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, industrial engineering, chemical engineering. And I would say by 1948, when the state was established, it was a full-blown engineering school with some signs of the science faculties that later on developed as independent faculties. And then almost immediately after the laying of the cornerstone in 1923, someone very important became involved with the Technion. And we have a picture here, actually, 
That figure in the middle with his hands clasped behind his back is Albert Einstein. Yes, this is uh, Albert Einstein, and he visited uh, the Technion and the Hebrew University, you have to be fair, uh, <laughs> in 1923. By the way, the Hebrew University opened its gates eight months after the Technion. My friend Menachem Ben Sasson, the president of the Hebrew University, tell me, eh, since eight months is less than a year, we can round it. So we <laughs> open at the same year. No way. Yeah. Eight months is eight months. Yeah. So we are the first. Uh, Albert Einstein was offered a job both by the Hebrew University and by the Technion to become a professor. Um, he came with his wife. And the rumors say that his wife didn't like what she saw around her. Uh, you know, they bought the materials to build the Technion on camels. So he decided to go back to Berlin before he went to Princeton. And he became the first president of the group supporting the Technion anywhere in the world in Berlin. And he continued to support both the Technion and the Hebrew University throughout his life. So Einstein was, I would say, the spiritual father of both the Technion and the Hebrew University. These Technion societies, which he was instrumental, of course, in the, in the first in America, but they exist around the world. They're really a unique part of the Technion's heritage, its growth, and its ongoing support. Can you talk a little bit about that and his involvement, in fact, in the, in the American Technion Society? Absolutely. Uh, the support for the Technion around the world is one of the reasons that the Technion now is one of the top universities of its kind in the world. Most of the development of the Technion was provided by means of these support groups around the world. The American Technion Society was established in 1941. Uh, jokingly, I can say that at that time, engineering wasn't a Jewish tradition. Very few Jews picked to be engineers. And the few engineers that were Jewish identify with this engineering school in the Middle East. But we had support groups in the UK, in Britain, in Switzerland, in France, in Australia, in South Africa, in South America, even in tiny Greece with 6,000 uh, Jews, a Jewish community, we have a support group supporting the Technion. Um, this is a unique uh, phenomenon which immensely, immensely helped the Technion around the year, uh, uh, during the years. I cannot believe we would achieve what we achieve without the support of these groups. And uh, we are grateful for them. There's a wonderful book called Technion Nation, which talks about the history of the university. And it uses this terrific phrase that the university went from stones to semiconductors. How, what were the important, what have been the important milestones in your mind, Professor yes. Levy, as it's made that journey? 1912, Cornerstone was laid. 1924, the first class started. 1954, we moved to the new campus on the top of the Carmel Mountain. These are the three major milestones of the first part of our history. The man responsible for the new campus is David Ben-Gurion the legendary prime minister, who was a very close friend of the Technion. He participated in every event on campus. An icon in the history of Israel. Unfortunately, they don't make heroes like this anymore. Somebody lost the template. Then, when we moved to the new campus, the Technion moved from an engineering school to a research university. The first faculty that moved from the old building which is on the slope of the mountain, to the top of the mountain, was the Faculty of Aeronautical Engineering. Again, a decision of David Ben-Gurion. He saw it as immensely important for the future of the state. Uh, there were jokes about it. There were very few airplanes at that time in Palestine. What they are going to fly on the Carmel Mountain, kites? <laughs> Fast forward, 2004. Both the faculty and the Israeli aircraft industry celebrating their 50th anniversary. The Israeli aircraft industry, one of the three largest industries in Israel, 5,000 engineers making everything from the aero rockets to satellites to jets to things that I cannot even mention. And 
5,000 engineers were graduating from this single faculty. Mm. So this was a major, major landmark. Around that time, we started the graduate school. The technical started to give a master degree and a PhD degree. Then 1969 is a major, major milestone in the history of the Technion. And three things happened in 1969. First, the Technion Senate decided to open a faculty of medicine. Now, everybody who understands academic politics should know that opening a faculty of medicine is not a simple matter. This is the most dominant faculty, the most expensive one that draw most of the attention. But when you read the decision of the Senate, it's almost prophetic. It said, in the future, medicine and technology will walk hand in hand. Mm. This is why the Technion, being a technological engineering school, must have a faculty of medicine. Israel today is an empire of medical devices because of the 1969 decision. Another consequence of this decision that I'm sitting here because I'm part of the Faculty of Medicine. Otherwise, I won't be here. I'm the first president of the Technion that comes from the field of life sciences or medicine. At the same year, the Technion opened the Microelectronic Institute. Now we all use the cliche that necessity is the mother of invention. But this is the reason the Technion opened the Microelectronic Institute. The Technion opened the Microelectronic Institute in order to produce the first infrared sensors, which were produced in the Technion. Again, fast forward, if you ask any founder of the high-tech sector in Israel, when, when it all started, they would say, 69, the Microelectronic Institute in the Technion. Mm -hmm. One of our graduates is here, yeah. Amos, uh, 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 and Amos gave me a, the, the draft of the first course in microelectronics he was teaching in 1971 in the Technion. So this was a turning point uh, in the history of the Technion and the country. At the same year, the Faculty of Electrical Engineering split from the Faculty of Computer Science. Uh, they became the flagship, both these faculties became the flagships of the Technion. One third of the students of the Technion right now, the undergraduate students, we have 9,000. One third belong to these two faculties. They are the backbone of the Israeli high-tech sector. In fact, if you take these two faculties, and we have 120 companies on NASDAQ, about 70% of the CEOs of these companies belong to these two faculties. So this was the impact on the faculty. Of course, there were fierce competitors. When I became a president, four and a half years ago, I decided to bring them closer by establishing a new center for computer engineering jointly run by the two faculties. So some of my friends came to me and whispered on my ear, Peretz, we have a suggestion. Go make peace with the Palestinian, it will be easier. <laughs> What's this interdisciplinary thinking that, that you're really specializing in? And I want to talk about that in just a moment. But let me go back for just sure. half a step. What you said is basically in about a 15-year period, culminating with these important decisions in 1969, the university made this pivot from engineering to a full-on research university. That's an incredible act of willpower in a very short period of time. And it means recruiting an entirely new faculty and completely changing the philosophy of the university. How did that happen, and, and how is that still influencing the Technion today? We have a mandatory retirement, for better or for worse. So at the age of 68, you have to retire. This, by the way, we're showing everyone here in the room. This, yes. is, this is how the campus looks now on a sunny day. This is the, the Tau building of computer science, which is uh, one floor taller than the building of electrical engineering. <laughs> Uh, electrical engineering used to be two floors higher than this one. So every couple of years, you see this domino effect. <laughs> By the way, I was successful. They have now a joint center. <laughs> there are some specific applications that I want to mention here, too, in fact, that have come out of the Technion's computer science efforts. Uh, one is uh, a little application which made AOL very famous a few years ago called ICQ. 
which Yossi Vardy pioneered. And there's a little company called WhatsApp, which just sold for a few billion dollars, which has its heritage in that whole ICQ technology. How, how did that come about? Well, uh, uh, as Yossi Vardy tells it himself, it's not Yossi Vardy. His son did it. Mm. Yossi Vardy was only the negotiator who got the $400 million. Um, if you look at Israel now, and you mentioned it, there are thousands of startup companies. You can see the roots during the period when ICQ was uh, uh, created. And um, these kids who had, uh, I think, an ambition to change the world, uh, developed ICQ, looking around and guessing what people are missing, what they need, uh, was the immediate uh, 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 communication, mm -hmm. the intimate communication, the, the fast way to respond. And uh, um, as Yossi himself told me several times, he, at the beginning, he didn't understand the importance of it. Uh, but once he sat with his son and his friends, he realized the potential. And uh, once uh, ICQ was sold, Yossi became the guru of uh, every young kid uh, who was thinking about a startup. So ICQ was uh, uh, the platform on which Facebook and uh, uh, WhatsApp and all the uh, um, get me uh, uh, type of programs uh, were developed. Sort of immediate online yeah, communication. immediate, instant online, absolutely communication. Well, as we're talking about this on the anniversary of the uh, World Wide Web's yep. unveiling, that's appropriate. There's another very famous algorithm that came out of the Technion, the, the famous Limpel Ziv algorithm, which is responsible for PDF documents and animated GIFs. The internet wouldn't be where it is today without animated GIFs. I think it's important to. Well, Ziv, uh, Jacob Ziv is now close to 90. Uh, he retired. He was the president of the Israeli Academy of Science, a uh, professor of electrical engineering. Um, Abe Lempel uh, is still active, uh, particularly with HP. He's from electrical engineering, he's from computer science. Mm -hmm. And their ingenious way of compressing information allowed the revolution of uh, information technology. But I'm angry at them very angry. They didn't patent it. I was if, going to they, ask you that. if they patent their equation, probably I could support the Israeli government and not the other way around. <laughs> what is the philosophy at the Technion about that? Because there's not a universal approach to this at any university. Yet. Well, we, um, I think that uh, we are not different than many universities around the world we are not an outlier. We allow our faculty to commercialize their intellectual property. We help them to do it. When I became a president, I saw it as a strategic goal of the university to do it. Um, I myself uh, uh, was infected with a bug of entrepreneurship, and I have four companies uh, uh, in my history. Uh, Right now, the last two days, two Israeli companies uh, um, raised um, nice uh, sums of money, Cortica uh, and uh, a, a, another company that is uh, filtering water. Uh, I truly believe that applied research and basic research are the two sides of the same coin. And uh, this is different than people who believe that universities should acquire new knowledge, period. I don't believe so. I think universities also should serve society and mankind. And one of the way to serve society is by providing new technologies, new uh, um, uh, ways of thinking, and provided them to society. I truly believe that this is one of the pillars on which societies should build universities. You mentioned this entrepreneurial drive, your own many others within the university. What is it about the way the Technion is constituted that has this as an additional element? I don't think there is a single uh, uh, factor that determines whether your graduates will be entrepreneurial or not. It's a combination. And I'll give you several of, of uh, uh, my explanations. Take a Nobel laureate, 
Danny Schertman, uh, the discoverer of the quasi-crystals, he won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2011, he is teaching a course on entrepreneurship for the last 27 years. And since I'm a lecturer in his course for at least 16 years, I can tell you it is attended by between 400 and 600 students every year. So if you multiply it by the number of years, you see how many uh, students out there were educated on entrepreneurship by a Nobel laureate. So this is one reason. The second reason is uh, the DNA uh, of the Israeli student. The Israeli student served in the army for three years. In the army, he learned how to take risks. He learned how to uh, handle equipment that sometimes cost tens of millions of dollars. I always give the example of my youngest daughter that whenever I, she told me what she's doing, I say, who is the responsible person giving to you? <laughs> <laughs> you. <laughs> and she did it, and she did it in a marvelous way. Um, they are eager to change the world, and they have uh, no respect for authority. <laughs> uh, it's interesting. I, we used to give a talks in South Korea and uh, Japan. Thousand students in the audience. You talk for about an hour, and then you ask any questions. Silence still. Nobody dared to raise his hand. In Israel, you start your lecture in your second sentence. Somebody raises his hand and say, Professor Lavi, I think you have a mistake in your second uh, <laughs> statement. So the social distance is such that allow you to challenge authority, to be much more daring. And when you combine all this with excellent education, you get this entrepreneurship ecosystem, as it is called today. Um, can you teach it? You need more, th more things than, than education. And many are coming now to Israel in order to understand this phenomenon of entrepreneurship that is very typical of what's happening here in this uh, part of the world. Sure. So everybody is talking about the Silicon Valley as number one and uh, Tel Aviv State as uh, number two. It's interesting that when we won the competition in New York, uh, Mayor Bloomberg told me, Peretz, I put it on the table. I'm envy of the Silicon Valley. This is why I would like to have you in New York. I'm gonna take a pause for a minute and talk a little bit about your own very distinguished career. Um, one does not really get to pursue one's calling as a university president. president. You, uh, you have to do other things like worry about all these issues we've been talking about, but uh, you have had an extraordinarily distinguished career in your field and sleep research and you told me a, a very poignant story uh, as we were getting ready for this discussion about a study that you did involving dreams which actually produced a very profound outcome and in a way that maybe those of us who just simply dream and don't think about studying it would ever think about it. Could you just talk a little bit about that study and the documentary that was made about it? Yes. Um, we spoke about the impact of trauma on dreams. Living in Israel, the issue of trauma um, is almost an everyday issue. One of uh, uh, the questions that we asked ourselves, and I'm talking about the mid beginning of the 80s, is how Holocaust survivors adapted to the life after the Holocaust. And in a very broad terms, you can find two groups. There is one group that survived the Holocaust, made splendid careers, splendid families, excelled in any measurable way, and if you didn't know that there are Holocaust survivors, you would never guess. The other group is a group that um, didn't fare so well. In and out hospitals, families that didn't function, uh, minor psychological problems, etc. So we decided at that time to study their dreams in order to understand what make the super adjusted, super adjusted, and the less adjusted 
less adjusted. And that was a phrase you assigned super adjusted right. to. I, I assigned it to them because I didn't know how to call them. Both of them adjusted. I mean, to survive the Holocaust and to continue living, you uh, adjusted. Adjust. But some were super and some were less. So in order to get their dreams, we put the electrodes, uh, studied them in the sleep laboratory, and we woke them up when the eyes are moving, REM sleep. Now, when you spend your time in the sleep laboratory, you and me or any one of the audience, and you wake him up when I see the REM sleep, 80% of the dreams are remembered. So here we have three groups, the super adjusted, the less adjusted, and an Israeli group without trauma in their past, as much as we can find Israeli without a trauma. The Israel remember 82% of the dreams, like we predicted. The super adjusted remember less than 30% of their dreams. We woke them up from sleep and they say, I didn't dream. I didn't dream. It's not they said, I dreamt and I don't remember. They denied dreaming. They were completely normal. Their dreaming sleep was completely normal. The same amount of dreaming sleep, physiologically speaking, than the other groups, but they didn't remember the dreaming. The less adjusted remember about 65% of their dreams. Half of them were nightmares. They didn't remember the nightmares spontaneously, but when we woke them up, they say, wow, thank you. You almost caught me. And he told us a story about hiding and the Gestapo coming and almost finding them. This was uh, the most surprising finding at that time in uh, the entire field of sleep research because nobody reported such a low rate of dream recall anywhere in the literature. And we came to the conclusion that in order to survive a massive trauma like the Holocaust, like being in Auschwitz, like being a twin in the Mengele barracks, you must suppress your dreamings or you must suppress your memories, both consciously when you are awake and unconsciously when you are asleep. One of the consequences of publicizing this story, and as I told you, the BBC made a whole movie on, this, mm -hmm. on, on the study, was letters that we got from Holocaust survivors. They thanked us for the study. Why? Because the second generation blamed them for not sharing the experience with them, not realizing that this was the defense mechanism. I am very happy that uh, it took about 25 years, and I think the scientific literature now support our view. And uh, after 9-11, in November, I got a telephone call from the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. For me or for us, this is like God uh, give you a telephone call. And I asked, what can I help you? I, wanted, I, I, I was sure he would, would like me to review a paper. He said, I would like you to write a paper for the New England. He said, what about? Traumatized patients and sleep and dreaming in light of the 9-11. So I told him, you know my views. He said, this is why I'm writing to you. I'm calling you. He said, how long do you give me? Two weeks. <laughs> I didn't sleep for two weeks. <laughs> But did you dream? That's the... Uh... <laughs> I wrote the paper, I sent it. Within 24 hours, I got it back with five reviews. And he called me again. And he said, Professor Lavi, review it immediately. It's going to print the moment you send it. And it was published. And it suggests that sometime you should leave the past behind you. Interestingly enough, there are studies, usually they are not publicized because they are negative studies on the firefighters of 9-11. Those that were briefed after 9-11 suffered more PTSD than those that were not briefed. Suggesting that sometime for a massive trauma, dealing with it on a daily basis doesn't serve to master the trauma, but to keep it alive. And somehow you have to put a curtain and to stop it. So this was one of the most fascinating studies I've done in my life. It was a PhD student of mine, Hannah Kaminer, a, a clinical psychologist who did the study. We later studied soldiers from uh, the Lebanon War and the Yom Kippur War, and we tried to understand how you can suppress your dreaming. 
And we realize that they are doing it by deepening sleep. They went to sleep with earphones, and we sounded clicks during sleep and measured their brain reaction. Now, they responded to louder clicks than the control group who were never traumatized. So their sleep was deeper than the control group, even though they complain about insomnia and about frequent awakenings and nightmares, suggesting they try to deepen their sleep in order probably to control the dreams. And those that had less dream recall were better off psychologically. You've been involved in two major expansions of the Technion, and the first one that I want to talk about is your partnership in New York yes. uh, for the, the Cornell Technion Institute. Um, this was obviously a subject that was very closely followed here, Absolutely. because a relatively close university named Stanford was also very interested in oh, it's here, right? Uh, <laughs> in being a part of this, and, and we don't have to rehash how that whole thing happened. I would really like to know, though, what the vision is for this development that's going to happen yeah. on Roosevelt Island. And here in the room, by the way, we're showing the artist's renderings of what the, the new campus will look As like. As I said, uh, Mayor Bloomberg was envy of uh, Silicon Valley and Route 128 in uh, Boston. And he uh, would like to have um, a research institute that will uh, provide New York with a scientific uh, uh, impetus to uh, push forward the economy. Now, I, when I met him, I asked him, you have Columbia, you have MIT, you have MIT in Boston, but you have Cornell. Don't you have enough engineers to do it? And I found out that the number of engineers in these engineering schools is smaller than our faculty of electrical engineering in the Technion. Very small engineering schools. So what we propose to the city is to have a research institute that will provide a master and a PhD degree, but in a very unique way. It is not going to be discipline structured. There are going to be three interdisciplinary hubs based on our experience in the Technion, in the connective media that fit the finance industry and the advertisement industry in New York, the built environment or the urban environment, and healthier life all link with information technology. So there'll be computer experts in each one of the hubs. Mm -hmm. Now, each student will have a mentor from industry and a mentor from the academia. So it's going to be a joint venture of the industry and the academia. The city loved it, and uh, Cornell loved it. By the way, we were looking for partners in this area too, and I won't elaborate. Uh, but the alignment with Cornell was very, very successful. We are now uh, uh, started teaching in Google headquarters in Chelsea in New York. They gave us free space until uh, 2017 when the first building, this tall building, is going to be ready. And when I ask Eric Schmidt why, he said, I'd like to be close to you. That's why. <laughs> um, the first group of uh, faculty members are there. And by the way, we are looking, and uh, this is very interesting. Some blamed me. You're going to cause brain drain from Israel to New York. I said, no, 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 it's the other way around. I'm looking for Israelis who are here in the US for more than 20 years and would like to make chatsi aliyah, half aliyah, half immigration to Israel. Uh -huh. Coming to New York and then only the Atlantic. <laughs> the first three that we hired fit this profile. So if they are here in this area, more Israelis with this profile will be happy to uh, recruit them to New York. The interdisciplinary approach that you described, I want to go back to that yes. for a minute, because everyone is chasing the dream of being interdisciplinary and bringing a cohort yep. of new young students up to think in that way. What is unique about this approach? It is unique. Uh, if somebody, let's say 20, 30 years ago, would say that the faculty of mechanical engineering in the Technion will recruit a cell biologist as a faculty member, you would say impossible. We have now a cell biologist in mechanical engineering, and we have a cell biologist in physics, and we have a group of researchers from computer science, electrical engineering, medicine and biology, and chemical engineering working in a group doing network studies. So we must combine expertise. 
Uh, he always give the example of Hershko and Chikanova, who won the Nobel Prize for discovering the ubiquity system. This is the system that destroy unwanted or faulty proteins. Sitting in the room for three years, pouring into their tubes. The room was part of a monastery, no big equipment, and they won the Nobel Prize. Science has changed. Mm. You need expertise from different fields. You need expertise of computer science in biology, as you need biologists in bioinformatics. So we created in the Technion several of these interdis interdisciplinary centers where people come from different faculties. In nanoscience and nanotechnology, we have 113 faculty members from 18, almost all the 18 faculties of the Technion. In autonomous systems, in life sciences and engineering. This is how we put cell biologists in mechanical engineering. So this is a new concept, and I believe that this is the future of science. We won't be able to do without it. The thing that I find so interesting that you're, you're now able to pursue because of this joint venture it is you don't start with the inherent difficulties that you mentioned a few minutes ago, trying to put two faculties together, trying yes. to get people to think about how they work across disciplines. This is going to be built into the recipe for this institute from the very beginning. Do you think that will make a difference? Absolutely. As I said, uh, uh, when I decided to take upon myself to build a joint venture between computer science and electrical engineering, I relied on the fact that the two new deans of these faculties were from a younger generation, without any history. And uh, I was successful. I was successful in doing it, and they have now a joint. Uh, I think that uh, the new generation of scientists were educated knowing that science now is interdisciplinary and must bridge between different uh, 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 expertise. And uh, this is something which probably will shape science for years to come. I have no doubt about it. We have some terrific questions from the audience. I'm going to get to those now. And then I'm going to end by asking you about China and your experience there so far, because it's really fascinating. So here's a, here's a very typical Silicon Valley question. Is there a Technion Venture Fund? If so, how large is it in dollars? And how many companies received funding from it in the last 10 years? Well, this is an interesting question. We support um, applied research in the Technion with two funds at the one end. One, we have money for seed uh, research, research of uh, seed ideas. Every year, it's competitive. We provide money for uh, between uh, seven and 15 faculty members to take their ideas and to test them whether they can be turned into prototypes, etc. Then I established, when I became a president, a small fund, $10 million, to support Technion-related companies at their second and third round of financing, not startups. They have to prove themselves. So second and third, we participate. First, to protect our shares, and second, to provide backwind to the researchers and to the investors. This was established two years ago. We already supported, I think, five, five companies, if I'm not mistaken. We are now in the middle of discussions, and I cannot, unfortunately, give names. It's one of the largest VCs in Israel of establishing a Technion fund between 75 and $100 million that will support Technion graduates, faculty, and students. It's in very uh, a critical stage right now. I was in New York at a meeting. Uh, I believe it will be probably finalized by the end of the summer. Here's an interesting question about your relationship to other educational institutions. In the, in the Arab Middle East. Uh, are there partnerships? Is there joint research? Are there, are there projects that you're undertaking with those universities? There is one, and uh, it is in water research with a uh, university in, um, on the West Bank. The only problem is that they don't allow us to publicize it. When I completed my job as a dean of medicine, it was 1999, I decided to celebrate it with a joint workshop of Arab medical students and technical medical students 
And since they didn't want to come to Haifa, we did it in Cyprus, which was very moving, very successful. The problem was we came back to Israel and the Intifada started. So all the relationship that were built there were destroyed. But on uh, March 3rd, uh, 10 days ago, we put, using the platform of Coursera, an internet course in nanoscience and nanotechnology. And I decided that the first course will be in Arabic. And we have 4,600 students from all the Arab world who registered to that course. Mm. And the course is given by Professor Hussam Hayek, one of our superstars from chemical engineering, who is an Arab living in Israel. And this course attracted 26,000 in English and 4,600 in Arabic. I'm so glad you mentioned that because Tom Friedman wrote a brilliant piece on that in the New York Times about a month ago. That MOOC on nanotechnology has students from Egypt, Syria, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Iraq, Kuwait, Algeria, Morocco, Sudan, Tunisia, Yemen, the Emirates, and the West Bank. What does that say about the future? It says that education can bridge the gap between enemies. And once you see the other, face, the other face of your enemy, I think the then negotiations are possible and reconciliation is possible. It's very interesting, you know, uh, I met, you mentioned China before. The Israeli ambassador to China is Matan Vilnai, an icon uh, figure in Israeli history. And when he met me, he said, Peretz, what you are doing in China is the job of 400 diplomats. So this MOOC course is a job of 600 diplomats. And it's enough that a student from Sudan or from Yemen or from the West Bank see Professor Hussam Hayek teaching in Arabic in the Technion to understand that this is different than what he had in mind before on Israel and on the Technion. It's amazing. I was the keynote speaker in Berlin uh, just last month in Israel Day. And there was a demonstration against the Technion with signs, Technion Apartheid University. And I spoke about this course. Mm. They say, I didn't know. Mm. I didn't know. So knowledge and education are keys to reconciliation. That's my belief. Let's talk about China for a minute, because you are now moving to go to China. You have a very important potential supporter who's interested in this, in Li Kaxing who's made education a, an enormous cause for his personal fortune around the world. Can you talk a little bit about what the, the outline of the Technion's yes. involvement in China is going to be? Well, it all started about the same time that Mayor Bloomberg was looking for universities to open uh, the research institute in uh, Manhattan. Mr. Li Kaxing is one of the wealthiest persons on earth who invest in philanthropy every year one billion dollars, mostly in mainland China, mostly in medicine and education. He built a university in a city called Shantou in the province of Guangdong, which is the city that his father was born. He, he built it there because of sentimental re reasons. And um, he decided that this will be the reform university of China, which means they will be allowed to have a board of governors to bring faculty from the West to implement uh, uh, practices that are Western in, in uh, uh, nature than Chinese. And he was looking for mentoring to Shantou University. And after looking at 70 universities, this is what he told me, he picked the Technion. He picked the Technion and he requested in a meeting that we had in Hong Kong that we build a branch of the Technion adjacent to Shantou University, where the Technion will give a Technion degree in China. This will be a private university teaching in English, and we in the Technion will be responsible for the program, for selecting the students, and for training the faculty. It was a, about a two-year dialogue between us, and then he came to Israel, Mr. Li, together with the governor of Guangdong, and we signed an agreement, 
And uh, we just last week submitted the program to the federal government in Beijing. The province will build the campus for us. The campus uh, uh, will be adjacent to Shantau University. And adjacent to the campus, there will be a technological park for Israeli companies and international companies that would like to open a market in China. We uh, granted $150 million by the province to build the campus. And Mr. Li, when he came to the Technion, gave us a gift of $130 million to develop the campus in Haifa to allow us to take upon ourselves this job. The first program that will be immediately implemented next year is environmental engineering. This is the most pressing issue in China, pollution, air pollution, water pollution. We have an excellent uh, faculty in this department. We are going to teach Chinese students first in Israel. Once the campus will be completed, they'll move to uh, uh, Shantau. The name of the institute will be TGIT, Technion Guangdong Institute of Technology. This was the uh, way they looked at it. And um, the next program will be probably processing engineering in two years delay. And then the third program, again, it's a 20 year program, 5,000 students and at least 200 faculty members. We started to recruit faculty members from Chinese origin, but not only Chinese origin. It will be international from all, of, all over the world. We'll bring them to Haifa. We'll train them in the Technion, and they will be our faculty in Chantal. This is uh, a very ambitious project. China has 2,000 universities, 2,000 universities. And he looked at it as a lighthouse that will influence the entire Chinese uh, scenario of higher education. Um, he's 86 years old. There is in Stanford the Likashi building of medical education. Mm -hmm. But you find he's uh, giving all over the world. And um, I found him one of the most impressive persons I have met in my life. Quite amazing. Mm. So we have now, on the west, New York, on the east, Chantal, and Haifa in the middle. And this will be very interesting. <laughs> and then finally, what will you do when you turn 68 and you term out as president? Do you have a plan? You know, I, I play with the idea. Uh, my, my book on sleep uh, was published in the early 90s by Yale University Press was translated into 16 languages. When I completed my job as a vice president, I thought that's it. So I started to write the second uh, edition of the book because so much happened since uh, the 90s to, to, to the beginning of the uh, 21st century. And I left it in the middle when I was elected president. So I'll go back to my book. <laughs> <laughs> it's been such an honor to have you with us today. Thanks for taking the Thank time. You. We really enjoyed Thank it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The Technion's collaboration with Cornell University is a bold new partnership in technology and innovation. There are hundreds of stories like this at the Computer History Museum. Join us next time for the Computer History Museum presents Revolutionaries.